Hi, I'm Tim. Welcome to our channel and thanks for logging on. Today, it's a showdown. Not the Jumbo versus the 5711. This is the supporting cast. The Audemars Piguet 15400 versus the Patek Philippe Aquanaut. Full bracelet steel automatics. Let's throw down. Start with the established power in the space. The Royal Oak traces its lineage back to Gerald Genta and 1972. The timepiece here, however, represents the everyday Royal Oak Automatic, not the rather delicate, thin, and traditionally inspired 39mm 15202 Jumbo. This is the 15400, 41mm, launched at SIHH 2000. 12. It was effectively the 40th anniversary Royal Oak Automatic. The watch is wonderfully impressive in its stance, its feel, its solidity, and its finish. It feels more like a baby offshore than a larger version of the Jumbo. The substance of the watch is exceptional, whereas the Jumbo feels, I don't want to say it has overtones of tinsel, it definitely feels like a dress watch on the wrist. This feels as bold as it looks. Solid, substantial, imposing, but still flat. The watch is only 9.8 millimeters thick with a generously sloped and polished bezel that allows it to slide underneath any dress cuff so it can go where no offshore can. Also, though 41 millimeters, it's a broad watch across the wrist. The stance is impressive. 51.6 millimeters lug to lug, and if you include the twin intermediate links, the two plots that join the bracelet to the case, you're going to find that this one's actually a burly 54.4 across the wrist. Now the bracelet here is made of a lot of metal. Not to a lower standard, there's just more beautifully finished stainless steel. First of all, finished the same way you would expect on a jumbo. That diminishing bevel flares as it moves away from the midcase and continues perfectly aligned down the individual link shoulders. Satin finished tops, in between you can see that the flanks of the intermediate links are all of high polish. That's a detail you only see as the undulations of the bracelet flex them through the visible field. They're mostly hidden, but beautiful beautifully executed. That high polish where you rarely see it is the hallmark of integrity. Now you can see the underside of the bracelet has plenty of gaps to vent the wrist void, pinching skin, pulling hair, and Audemars Piguet gives you a bracelet in which all removable links are fixed in place by screws. Why aren't all sports watches made like that? Stay tuned. The clasp feels sturdy enough to be mounted on an offshore, and that's one of the reasons why I prefer this watch for daily use over the 15202. The 15202 is glorious. It is the closest watch to the original 5402, but it is not the sturdiest standard automatic Royal Oak. This is. It's got the metal and the mass to prove it. Now the case is gorgeous. The facets are razor sharp where they're supposed to be, and beautifully rounded and polished where they need to be. The result is a contrast between angles and curves, polished and satin, all of it laid down by hand, and it's one of the decision points of this contest, because this is where the Royal Oak really opens a gap over the Aquanaut. Details of bezel, bracelet, and case finish. It's also a wonderfully slim watch. 9.8 millimeters thick for a watch that feels and looks more like an offshore on the wrist is a wonderful luxury when it comes time to wear this thing in the real world with tighter cuffs. The dial is sensational. Blue tapisserie still cut on a 19th century pantograph style lathe. It's basically a mimicry engine that takes a large template that looks like this dial and it recreates the dial on a small blank that eventually becomes what you see here. This is the blue that's now a Boutique exclusive, it is a galvanized blue that has a fairly high rejection rate. It is the rarest of the now four dial colors. You have silver, ruthenium gray, black, and blue. Blue is the one to get. You'll also note applique white gold indices, white gold AP logo, white gold hands, and a monotone date disc that wonderfully blends in. Loop this dial. The texture of the tapisserie is worth close scrutiny. It's a wonderful transcribed pattern that delights in detail, just as it does from arm's length. The case back, the movement, Audemars Piguet 3120, released in the mid-2000s. It is a, let's get closer, it is an automatic winding, manufacturer 60 hour. It has a full balance bridge with a free sprung balance for shock resistance, and you can see it uses an oversized, let's give ourselves a bit more light, uses an oversized Gyromax style balance, beaten away at 21,600 vibrations per hour, bi-directional rotor that has no rotor wobble, ceramic rotor bearings for efficiency. The rotor is engraved with the coats of arms of the Audemars and Piguet families, 22 karat gold, not in any way following industry trends toward 21, 18, or even base metal rotors. Nicely executed, Cote de Genève, bevels, 
polished screw heads, but principally mechanical in its finish. There's some hand finishing here, but not to the extent of the Patek. The movement features both stop seconds and a quick set date. Screw down crown, 50 meters water resistant. The watch is swimmable. I would not swim with the Jumbo with its 50 meter water resistant rating. That one has a push down crown. The screw down here makes all the practical difference for me. Okay, the Aquanaut. The Aquanaut was released in 1997, the first model. In 2007, we got the model you see here. This is the 5167. In fact, this is the 5167-1A001. The Aquanaut, originally released on a strap and designed for a strap, is available rarely on a full bracelet, which makes it a natural rival. This is not the 5711, just as the 15400 is not the Jumbo. So this is sort of a battle of the other brothers within their model lines. And you can see that the watch already is easier to wear on a smaller wrist. Now, it's slimmer by far. 8.2 millimeters thick. They both wear with a cuff, but this one wears limpet tight to the wrist. Lug to lug, it's 47 millimeters, and even with the end lengths of the bracelet, it's 48.6, which means it's almost six millimeters narrower across the wrist. If you have that smaller wrist of 14 and a half centimeters circumference or smaller, maybe even 15 or smaller, this is the one you want. The timepiece is 40 millimeters in diameter, and it wears a 40. It doesn't wear two or three millimeters larger than its nominal size, like the Royal Oak. The spacing between the lugs is 21 millimeters, and note, you can fit a strap here quite easily. It's easy to change. Do you want the OEM rubber strap, or do you want to go aftermarket? You have that option with the Aquanaut. The bracelet, however, while comfortable, is nothing like the bracelet on the Royal Oak, and this is where we really need to juxtapose and show the difference in detail. Look at the polish of the intermediate links in between. Look at the polish of those bevels on the flanks. Look at the sharpness of the satin finish and the break with the bevel. You can see the tolerances of the bracelet. The bracelet on the Aquanaut, by comparison, is super comfy and wonderfully flexible. You can pull it straight down around a small wrist. See, there's no flare, but here's the thing. It feels like it came off a Girard Perigo Laureato. That's a good watch. It's not a Patek Philippe. So the fact that this bracelet doesn't feel Patek and doesn't look Patek means, quite frankly, Audemars Piguet advantage. The watch is wonderfully comfortable. You can see those gaps are big and there are rounded off edges to the links on the underside to avoid pinching skin, pulling hair, or otherwise compromising comfort. Now, look at those links. They are fixed in place by pin sleeve mechanisms. Hard to size and frankly, cheaper to make. This is where I expect screws advantage AP. The clasp is substantial, however. It's a good looking piece. It features a twin trigger design. It's nicely finished inside, but it doesn't have quite the degree of detailing that the satin and blasted interior of the AP Royal Oak clasp has, nor does it have quite the overall solidity. There's enough play in this mechanism, bracelet and clasp, that I feel Patek Philippe certainly helped to build a gap between the Nautilus's pricing and that of the Aquanaut. You can see where the difference in price Price comes from. And this watch knew $21,890 versus the Royal Oak, which knew costs $17,800. We'll talk about pre-owned in a moment, but the moral of the story is the Patek comes out ahead in that respect. The case, simplified compared to the Nautilus. You can see it's three parts, case back, mid case, and bezel. There's not nearly the complexity of the wing interlock construction, and that's how Patek helps to keep this watch a little bit more affordable. You can see it is nicely done though. The finish that's there is by hand, although there is more assistance by machines than you'll find in the case of the Nautilus. The dial features a light sunburst and a bit of a gradient. It's lighter, it's almost a brown silver at center, black at edge, applique white gold numerals, this watch will absolutely ace the loom test. There will be a loom shot of both, this watch will win the competition. I don't love the contrasting white date wheel amidst this sea of gorgeous gradient metallic. I do love the geosphere cut on the dial, but it seems less logical and less coherent when not paired with a similar embossed pattern on the rubber strap. The timepiece is nicely executed and easy to read day or night. Turn it all over, and Patek starts to regain in movement finish, what perhaps it loses in case finish. Now you're looking at Patek Philippe caliber 324 SC, center seconds. Let's see if we can get a little bit closer here. Okay, so the movement is hand finished and to a degree that you're only going to find in higher level Royal Oaks, grand complications in the jumbo. The 15400 is not executed to this degree. You can see the light up of the mirrored anglage laid down with a file by hand and then smoothed and polished. This is not the machined bevel that you find on the AP. Likewise, the Cote de Genève are clearly laid down with abrasive wheel. I can't say for a fact that they're not stamped on the AP. The black polished screw heads feature chamfered slots as well as 
chamfered circumference, something you don't get on the AP screws. The watch features two separate perlage patterns, one of which is on the center of the rotor, one of which is on the base plate. The movement features a guaranteed precision from the factory of minus three plus two. Advantage Patek Philippe AP makes no promises. It does feature a free sprung balance and it has a silicon hairspring for anti-magnetism, whereas the AP continues to use a ferrous hairspring. Top it all off with a screw down crown screwed in case back and 120 meter water resistance and the Patek starts to pull back even with the Royal Oak. So let's recap the advantage advantages, starting with the 2007 to present Aquanaut 5167 1A, a watch that's easier to wear on a small wrist. Pull that bracelet straight down, thinner on the wrist, easier to wear with a cuff. This is the timepiece to wear for small wrists and those who have a taste for smaller watches. Also brand status, there's no doubt that a Royal Oak is a powerful statement of horological connoisseurship, but also hipness. Uh, you will be a connoisseur and you will be hip if you buy a Royal Oak, but if you buy a Patek Philippe steel sports watch, uh, you automatically win that battle. In terms of the here and now, that's where the pop is right now. Pop culture says Patek in steel trumps any Audemars Piguet. The timepiece is a wonderful store of value, selling new for $21,890 it actually sells pre-owned for twenty nine to thirty thousand. So the economic argument, provided you're not buying pre-owned, the argument is for the Patek. Also important, Loom, far better on this watch. And for that matter, legibility day or night. As a timepiece, this one wins out. Also important to note, the watch is more anti-magnetic and more water resistant. So in two important dimensions of sports watch durability, advantage Patek Philippe. The timepiece has a wonderful caliber finish that is truly executed by hand, both the overall and the parts. This is one that warrants not just a glance with the eye, but a glance with the loop. Better finish of the caliber, and distinctly so, even to the naked eye. Also important to note, uh, this is a watch that frankly eschews planned obsolescence. The exact same timepiece since 2007 and visually almost completely indistinguishable from the 1997 Aquanaut. This one has the legs. The Royal Oak has been revised several times and there's simply no mistaking a 15300 with a 15400. So while the Royal Oak is an enduring design, the 15400 specifically doesn't quite have the same degree of immunity to obsolescence and succession that the Aquanaut has had to date. Now, the Royal Oak, a few things. As a model, the Royal Oak certainly has a heritage that the Aquanaut cannot match. Even if it doesn't quite have the status factor, you're a horological connoisseur and a collector, and so am I, and I would go with the Royal Oak on that basis over the Johnny Come Lately Aquanaut. Capable color, 60 hour power reserve in this caliber versus 35 to 45 for the 324 in the Aquanaut. A full bridge and a free sprung index for shock resistance, not just free sprung and hacking seconds, something Aquanaut does not have. Wrist presence, it's simply a larger watch. The timepiece has a stance and a footing that frankly you would need a much larger Patek, something like a 5990 to equal. Also important to note, detail finish of the dial, of the case, of the bracelet, the substance on the wrist, the feeling of heft, the quality of imparting a knowledge of that for which you've paid. This is simply a superior option in that regard. Also important, lower MSRP, 17,800 versus 21,890 for the Aquanaut. So if you're buying new, this is the watch to get. And five year warranty versus two years for the Patek Philippe. So this one even has the factory backing it. Not with a precision promise as with the Patek, but with five full years of peace of mind. So which one do I pick? Even without the crowd-pleasing blue dial, my choice here would be the Audemars Piguet. Patek Philippe is a wonderful company that makes beautiful projects. You will never be disappointed. And from a movement snob standpoint, the finish of the Patek grabs me. But the Audemars Piguet, holistically and as a value proposition, is my personal choice. You guys let me know in the comments below which one you choose. One final smackdown, Last Licks goes to the Aquanaut.